In Singapore, people call me the gangster lawyer. And amongst the Singaporeans, I'm known by many names, including the long hair lawyer, the lawyer with the tattoos. And there's a reason why. And this is the reason. I grew up in a very rough and a very old neighborhood in Singapore, known as Phuket Mera, within the Red Hill Precinct. Back in the days, the older Singaporeans will tell you this wasn't the easiest neighborhood to grow up in. So at a very young age, I wasn't taught to aspire. I wasn't taught to dream. I was taught to survive. And survive I did. I've been failing all my life in school at a very young age, all the way until secondary school or even after that. I started smoking at the age of 12, drinking at the age of 14, and started involving myself uh, with the secret society and got involved in my first fight at the age of 16 after secondary school. So what happened after secondary school was really a period of aimlessness and wantonness, to say the least. I was lost in drugs, in violence, in alcohol. I was filled with rage. And I couldn't pull myself out from that state of despair. And everything after that went downhill. So when I got out from national service, you know, I did not have the qualifications nor the working experience. And I was 20 years old, going on to 21 years old. I was young, I was brash, you know, whatever money that I earn today, I will squander it away on drugs, on drinks, um, making merry with my friends. I didn't think about saving it or investing it for that matter. So it was really a, a phase, you know, a phase of teenage rebellion. So um, after one year of working, um, I did not have enough savings, I was broke. And the biggest problem with my uh, alcoholism is that of rage, you know. Whenever I'm intoxicated, I, I flew into rage, big rage. And, and I use violence on people around me, on my friends, on my loved ones. And things got to a very, very bad moment on one night where I remember I, I got into a fight uh, with, with a girl, my girlfriend then. And, and I used violence on her. And to the point, I almost threw her off the building. And behind the back of my head, after I'm done with that, I plan to throw myself off the building as well. Because unknown to me then, I was laboring under depression and I harbored suicidal tendencies. But it was at that critical moment that somebody appeared and pulled the both of us to safety. And when I got up from the floor, this person gave me two tight slap. And subsequently, I passed out. So after a few hours, when I woke up from my drunken stupor, I saw my father seated in the living room. And then the whole house was overturned. The television was on the floor. The sofa was flipped upside down. And I thought then he did all of this because he was angry. But later did I know I did all of this without remembering any of it. So I walk up to my father. I sat beside him. And I still remember my father asked me this question. Joe, what is hurting you so badly inside your heart? Why are you so angry? And my reply was, I don't know. I just don't know what is hurting so bad. And I don't know what is missing in my life. I can't seem to find my purpose. And thereafter, my dad said this, which changed my life forever. He said, Joe, you have been naughty, rebellious, to the point of being criminal. All your formative years. Have you ever wondered what is it like 
to do something good for yourself, to feel good about it, and be a good person. Give yourself a chance to try the other side of life. After he finished saying that, he got up, he went back to his room, shut the door, and slept. And there I was, thinking about what he said, and telling myself, moments after that, that perhaps it's time for me to embrace what I cannot change, to accept all my past feelings, and to restart. After that fateful night, after listening to what my father told me, I got down to thinking seriously for the first time in my life. And the first step I took was to internalize what happened, to embrace all my feelings, all my past, which I cannot change, to forgive myself. And after I did that, I move on to the second stage, which is to come up with a plan. Go back to the basics of life, the fundamentals, such as waking up early every morning at 8 a.m., make my own breakfast, or buy my own breakfast for that matter, read the newspaper, get to know the world around you, because the world is not just about you. So I got back to restarting my life. And thereafter, I went to the third stage, which is to start looking for a job. But then, I do not have the qualifications or the work experience. So all I could find was odd jobs. From renovation works, to moving furnitures, to selling second computers, to the point of even washing the toilet for one of Singapore's biggest law firm then. So one day, I chanced upon an advertisement from a private school that offered a private diploma in law from a foreign university. And there I was, down and out in my life, just restarted. And I thought, maybe this is just my fantasy playing out. Because when everybody is at their lowest, they will always think of something better. It's only natural. And I thought maybe this is just my mind playing tricks on me. So after reading the advertisement, I put it out of my mind for the next two to three weeks, but it kept coming back. Something in me tells me that I have to do this. So one day, I pluck up the courage and I approached my parents, but then they weren't talking to me. And rightly so, after all that I've done. And I remember during dinner time, I approached my father and asked him, can I go back to school? And then I remember he laughed, followed by my mom. And rightly so, because at that moment, I laughed together with them. I couldn't believe myself, those words coming out from my mouth, that I want to go back to school because I've been failing school all my life. And there I was, 22 years old, wanting to go back to school, a night school, to study for a private diploma. And so my parents asked me, how much do you need? And I said I needed $8,000 for that course. And coming from a poor family like mine, $8,000 was a stretch. We can't afford it. But what my parents did then really encouraged me. They went to borrow that sum of money from our relatives. And after much persuasion, our relatives loan us that sum of money to enroll me into the private school. So for one year, um, I was doing the, the, the odd jobs during the day, and at night, I was attending the night school to prepare for this diploma. One year later, I passed. I did not do well, but I passed after failing all these years. So it was an encouragement. It was a sign that 
I'm able to achieve if I put my mind to it, if I start. So one thing led to another, and with that diploma in my pocket, I went and asked my parents again, can I do something a bit further than just the diploma? And then my parents asked me, what now? And I said, I want to be a lawyer. And this time around, they burst, into, burst out laughing. But the difference is that I did not laugh this time. I was serious. I wanted to be a lawyer. And they asked me why. And I said, because I hope to save the world. I hope to help people like myself one day with the knowledge of the law. And this time around, my parents knew that I was not kidding around. But yet, it was very difficult because then I was only able to enroll in a university overseas with a private diploma. And it cost up to $150,000. So what happened after that? Ran around the island to approach the different banks and finally we managed to secure a bank loan to finance my education overseas in the United Kingdom. So I was enrolled in a university in the United Kingdom for a period of three years on a bank loan. So I still remember that the day I flew to the United Kingdom and when I touched down, I opened up my suitcase and I found a, 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 a packet that was tucked at the side of the luggage. And when I opened it, it was actually uh, my antidepressants uh, medication. So I remember I called my mother straight away to inform her that I've landed safely in the UK and I've checked myself into the hostel. And I asked her, I said, why did you put this packet into my luggage? I'm in a much better shape now and I have a purpose in life. And I knew my mission was to go to UK, get my law degree and come back to Singapore and be the lawyer that I want to be. And this was exactly what my mom told me said, boy, if things get rough in the UK, take the medication. Don't do anything foolish. Don't get into trouble. Don't kill yourself. Life doesn't stop just because you fail at something. So the medication is a safety net in case you ever do get depressed. And when she said that, tears rolled down my face and I assured her that I'm on a better track now. I will not take the medication. And I promise her that I'll come back to Singapore in one piece. And that's it. Three years gone by really quickly. And I managed to actually uh, get a second upper class honours for my law degree. So for the first time in life, I achieved a little bit of something for my academics. I did good. And I flew back to Singapore with that packet of medication and threw it away in Singapore. A promise made, a promise kept. Throughout that three years, it was difficult because you learn to be independent. You learn to fend for yourself. And at the same time, against all odds, I succeeded without relying on any medication. I have learned then to take the blows in life. No matter how difficult life was, not to go back to a state of despair, not to rely on anything, but purely on the strength of your heart and your mind. So as they said, the past is history. I came back to Singapore and started my journey as a criminal defense lawyer. And at the start of my career, I told myself, just like what I told my parents then before I embarked on this journey, that if I ever do become a lawyer, my life's purpose is to help the world, is to help people like me. And that I did. I started my career defending the underprivileged in Singapore. I provide my service pro bono, is a Latin word which means for the public good. 
So I provide my professional services to the poor for free. I gave them a voice. And that to me is my purpose. And it has been 15 years and counting. And I have never looked back since. Every day to me is a mission. There is no stop line. It is not a job. It is a mission to help, to educate, to raise awareness for the marginalized. So I still remember very clearly that in my second year of practice, I attained a little bit of prominence where um, a local newspaper did a feature story on me. It was dated the 16th of February, 2013. It was on a Saturday. It was during the Chinese New Year period. So that story documented how I turned my life around because my father woke me up to my senses. And now that I've changed my life, I'm using it to further the purpose of helping people. So it was a, a feature story worth celebrating. But that morning when the story came out, my phone was ringing nonstop with um, congratulatory messages from my friends and my loved ones. I've yet to read the papers. But then a phone call came from my mother. She was at the hospital. Then my father was very sick. He was diagnosed with multiple cancers. He was lying in the hospital's ICU um, ward. So my, father, my mother called me and said, please rush down. I think your father might not be able to make it today. And I rushed down to the hospital. And when I reached the ICU, I saw a couple of doctors surrounding him, trying to resuscitate him. So we were waiting um, patiently outside the ward. And after a while, the doctors came out. And I still remember one of the doctors came up to me and asked me this. Are you the son that is a lawyer that is featured in the papers today? And I said, yes. And thereafter, he said, this morning when we were doing our roundings, um, we saw the story. So we brought the papers up. We wanted to show your dad to encourage him to have the will to live. But before that happened, your father went into a state of shock and we have to resuscitate him. The papers, they are still on the table. Go inside right now. Do your part as a son and read the story to him. And I did that. And I went in, even though he was in a state of coma. I took up the papers and I read out to him about how he changed my life so that I can help other people now. And tears rolled down his face, even though he was in a state of coma. I knew he hurt me. And I told him, you must live. You must fight to live. Because today is a day of celebration. And the very next day, unfortunately, he passed away on the 17th of February, 2013. Just one day before his birthday. And I remember in the ICU, everybody around me was crying. They were upset, rightly so. But this time round, I wasn't sad. I was angry. Instead of celebrating this moment with my family, I was in the ICU weeping over his death. I was angry. I signed off his death certificate. I collected his body to prepare for the funeral after. And all this happened during the Chinese New Year period. I thought to myself that the funeral will be a very quiet affair because it was during the Chinese New Year period. So the Chinese are very superstitious. They would think that, you know, it is not um, normal 
to attend a funeral during the festive occasion. But to my surprise, everybody turned up. People from all walks of life, the powerful, the rich, the commoners, the marginalized, they came out to show their condolences. I was very heartened by those five days of the funeral way, but I was angry. I was angry that the person who changed the course of my life wasn't there to see my achievements. After my father passed away, I was angry and I fell into a state of depression all over again for a period of six months. Then I wanted to give up. I was thinking to myself, why am I doing all these things to help other people whereby I can't even help my own family, my father. So I felt a state of despair and helplessness. But after those six months, I came to terms with his death, with his demise, and realized that if I stop now, that is the end of his legacy and also mine. So internally, I processed it. And I told myself, the show must go on. I will carry on helping the marginalized in hope that this will honor whatever that he has done for me. And that is what I did. So, but of course, as mentioned earlier, I defended the poor pro bono many a time. So financially, I wasn't the most stable to say the least. You know, in fact, at one point, a lot of people, they were calling me Singapore's poorest lawyer. So I was paid with flowers, with chocolates, with cookies, or sometimes with fruits, you know. But rarely with money because of the people that I help. They can't afford it. So on a personal front, my financials took a beating. I went into debt. So at that point, after being a lawyer for some almost eight years, my debt snowballed. And I own a bank almost close to $100,000 to the stage of bankruptcy. And of course, the nature of my job, the intensity of it took a toll, not just on my financials, but on my marriage, which broke down. Also on my health, and I fell into a state of uh, medical emergency. I suffered a, a mouse stroke scare. I was admitted into the hospital and there I was lying on a hospital bed, thinking whether any of this, was it truly worth it? And then I was reading this poem, Invictus. It's a Latin word, it means unconquerable. And I found strength in that poem. And I told myself, restart, just like what I did so many years ago. Restart again. So after I came out from the hospital, um, I was down and out, and I was renting a room, not very far from the courts. I do not know what to do, but I know I have to start. I have to take a baby step. So I pluck up the courage. I borrow a sum of money from some very good friends to start my own practice, Invictus Law Corporation. Not to be undefeated in the courtroom, but to be undefeated in the human spirit. So it has been four years now, and I persisted from a team of four we grew to a team of 12. From one small little office, we grew to seven offices. I managed to pay off all my debts. I managed to prevent myself from bankruptcy. As such, I'm able to carry on lawyering. So when, when I think back about this part of my life, all the struggles and all the tribulations that I went through, it wasn't easy. 
it wasn't easy at all. But the only lesson that I took away from all of this is that I didn't give up. I didn't. People will mostly not remember how the story begins, but people will always remember how the story concludes. And in the same vein, you cannot choose how your life begins, but you can definitely choose how your life will end. So, embrace your feelings. Accept your past, which you cannot change. And as the saying goes, a ship in harbour is always safe, but that is not what a ship is built for. It may well be a road less travelled, but as long as you take the baby steps to rediscover yourself, to restart and to recover, the future will always be bright. And this is the story of Singapore's gangster lawyer.